Hey everyone, thanks for joining our webinar this afternoon. My name is Caroline Katsarubis. I am with the Freight Farms marketing te team and I will be guiding today's conversation. We're going to be talking all about farm to school and how vertical farming can fuel campus sustainability, education and employment with our very special guests from St. Joseph's College of Maine. Here is everything we'll be covering today. We'll start with a quick overview of freight farms for those of you who aren't familiar. Then we'll jump into getting to know our speakers and discussing the farm at St. Joseph's, specifically how it integrates into dining hall operations as well as undergraduate curriculum and how, how it's almost completely student run. Then we'll have a live question and answer session. So throughout the webinar, as you have questions, we definitely encourage you to plug them into the panel on your screen and we'll answer some of them live and then save some for later in the presentation as well. So just to start, at Freight Farms, our mission is pretty simple. We want to democratize access to fresh local food and in order to do that, we need to decentralize food production and make it possible to grow food in any climate. This mission is a major reason why we host these webinars. At the end of the day, the way we see the mission play out in real life is by seeing all the ways our customers take the technology and run with it. So the way we empower anyone to grow food anywhere is through our by providing the entire platform so that is the modular vertical farm in a shipping container the software for remote monitoring and control and then our support services um, so the greenery is our newest model container farm we released it earlier this year it's a bit different than the farm we'll be speaking about today which is the leafy green machine so if you're interested in learning about the new features of the greenery, we definitely encourage you to head to our website. We have a lot of great information there. And then Farmhand is the software accompaniment for the greenery and client services. It works with all the smart in-farm components to help you monitor, control, schedule, and report on everything that's happening in the farm. This helps operators optimize their growing environments, and it also really helps us during our support calls for our team to be able to basically see inside of your farm and um, really diagnose any issues that may be going on. You can learn more about this at freightfarms.com farmhand. And then we really think about client services as what sets our sets us apart and as um, another one of our products. And we have an entire team dedicated to helping you run the farm, which includes everything like delivery logistics of your farm, training and technical support as well. You can learn even more about that um, on our website as well. So this platform that we're talking about is empowering so many different people and organizations to grow their own food. And while this is by no means an all-encompassing list, it does show generally the groups that we work with, which are you know, individuals interested in starting their own small business, soil farmers looking to extend their growing season, restaurants looking to have a steady supply of local produce. Um, and we also work with a lot of great nonprofit organizations looking to increase access to fresh produce in their communities, um, as well as corporations actually that are interested in extending health and wellness programs on campus. So today we're really zooming in on one particular group that we work with and that is schools. And we work with schools of all kinds from public schools to private schools, K to 12, higher education, and how the farm is used on campus truly varies depending on the motivations of the school. We've seen it purely used as a source of local produce for dining halls or as more of like a learning lab, space for research, or as a way to add you know, new sustainability initiatives to campus. And it's this 320 square foot box, which you can see in all of these amazing pictures where schools have chosen to wrap their farms in their logos or different pictures and visuals. Um, 
and it can have a far reaching impact outside of just the produce that's grown inside. And to read more about the other schools we work with, I definitely encourage you to go to our website again. All month we've been promoting their projects for Farm to School Month. So if anyone didn't know, we still have a month, um, a week left of this awesome month. So we'll be continuing to highlight these um, schools throughout the day. And today we're going to be hearing from one college in Maine that uses the farm for so many different initiatives. And they are a great example for how to use it in a way that extends far outside the campus and into the community. So without further ado, uh, let's introduce today's speakers. We have four very knowledgeable individuals joining us to tell us all about the farm at St. Joseph's. Are you guys there? Hi, okay, um, let's just go around and just do a quick, hi, hello, my name is, um, and what you do at St. Joseph's. Uh, oh. <laughs> hi, I'm Maya Atlas. I am the Enterprise Startup and Operations Manager for St. Joe's. Hi, I'm Hillary Lampkin. I am the Pearson Staff Day Manager and the um, Operations Manager for our freight farm on campus. Hi, I'm Rebecca Brewery. I'm studying marine and environmental science with minors in biology and sustainability. Hello, I'm Billy Schwartz. I'm a math major and a business minor. Great. Thank you, everyone. I know this is going to be a super valuable conversation for our listeners. And we are, um, this is probably the most uh, individuals we've had on one webinar. So if uh, we're going to be moving just so everyone can get um, a turn to speak and if we can't hear anyone, just let us know through the panel um, and we will uh, definitely change stuff up so that everyone can be heard. Um, I will plug again uh, that we will be having a live question and answer session at the end of this webinar. So if you have questions throughout, just plug them into the panel and um, we will get to them at the end. Great, so let's jump into things. Um, I think the best place for us to start is just with a general overview of St. Joseph's College. Um, Maya, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. So St. Joseph's College is a small Catholic liberal arts college in rural Maine. We are located on the second largest lake in Maine, which is Sebago Lake, which also happens to be the water source for Portland, Maine. Uh, we have about a thousand students on campus, about 900 of them live on campus and about thousand commute. We also have an online program for graduate degrees. We find that the most popular majors on campus are definitely nursing. We have a lot of business students. Um, education is also a really big program and all three of those have actually been really beneficial for having the freight farm on campus. So it's been a really nice alignment there. Great, awesome. Um, I've, from all the pictures, it's an absolutely beautiful campus. Uh, I can imagine it's great to be at at this time of year as the, the seasons are changing. Yes, that's uh, great. <laughs> great. Uh, Hillary, do you mind giving us a listener, uh, giving our listeners a high level overview of just the food operations on campus? Sure, um, at Pearson's Cafe, that's our, our major um, cafe on campus. We serve a little over 9,000 meals a week. Um, and we also have a couple other little cafes on campus, which um, we do supply lettuce and greens for them as well. Um, and it's important us being a, a rural, rural campus, it's important for us to look for opportunities for our students um, to work on campus. So the freight farm has been a great opportunity for many students. Um, as you know, we run the freight farm uh, all year long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and we always are supplying either the campus or um, in the summer, we also have a lot of weddings and a lot of farm to table dinners. Um, so we do a lot of specialty things for them as well. Fantastic. And, yeah. um, I was reading a little bit online about just like the, the mantra of the food operations on campus. And I, I saw that a lot of um, menus are written based on the seasonality uh, and what's the what the availability of the regional products are. Um, so does that mean you kind of change what's offered depending on what you can source locally? Yes, we try to um, we try to get the majority of our food from our local farmers. 
Um, so depending on what's in season, um, that depends on what we're gonna be serving on a week to week basis. Wow, I think that's such a great way to kind of instill the importance um, of eating with the seasons to the actual student body to kind of get them used to, um, you know, there's not gonna be one thing available all year round on the menu, unless it's the freight farms produce that is, but um, that's right. <laughs> I, I thought that was great when I read that. Uh, so Hillary, you've, you've been there um, for quite some time. Have you noticed any changes in the things that students are interested in eating? Are they asking for any specific items? Um, well, we do have a lot of students now that are either gluten-free or dairy-free, uh, vegan, vegetarian. Um, so we do get a lot of requests around those areas. So of course the freight farm fits into every single one of those. So um, we've been able to, to do some um, testing of different products to see how they grow and, uh, and see how the students like them. Awesome. Great. Thank you both for, for that overview. Um, I think now let's transition into the discovery of freight farms. Um, its arrival on campus is a little unconventional. Maya, can you tell us a little bit about Saint, how St. Joseph's first found out about freight farms? Yeah, absolutely. So we had been in discussions um, with Hannaford Supermarkets for a little bit. A big initiative at the college is to find more ways for both our services to plug into our community, but the community to plug into our food services. So some of that involves opening our campus cafeteria to more folks. Some of it involves bringing things in, um, and Hannaford's been a really great partner for that. So originally Hannaford was hoping to have freight farm locations at some of their retail storefronts, but they were finding that um, with their grocery and large scale model, it wasn't really the right approach for them. And they found that with our background and with our sustainability focus, we would be a really good partner for it. Um, so we acquired it, I believe, in May of 2017 directly from Hannaford and have continued to work with them as a partner um, and will probably do so more in the future as well. That's great. So in addition to using the farm to just serve more local produce, did the did it meet any of St. Joseph's existing initiatives at the time? Totally. I think it's met um, most of them, actually. So Hillary touched on a big one, which is that as a rural college campus, we really want to have job opportunities for our students on campus. So one of them was just being able to provide enriching job opportunities to students who are here without having to get in a car and leave campus. Uh, a big part of that has also been community-based learning, which is a program that is popular along, among a lot of the curriculum on campus which basically allows professors to ask students to have projects that extend outside of their classroom. So they have a, a local partner, oftentimes off campus, but we're able to be an on-campus partner again for nursing students who have rigorous schedules or students who aren't able to travel. Um, so from a student learning and job perspective, it's been really big, but of course, from the sustainability standpoint, having greens year round for all of our students to eat for our summer events, like Hillary mentioned, has been really vital to that. And as we're developing more and more ways to become a food resource for our rural community, um, having greens year round has been totally vital to that. Great, I think that's a perfect overview. Um, I'm curious, Hillary and Maya, at which point did you become involved with the farm? Um, I became involved right at the start. Um, another lady and I were asked to basically hop in and get it going and figure it all out. So um, when we were asked, we were excited to take on that opportunity. And so we went to farm school in Boston for um, a weekend and learned all about how to run the freight farm and came back the following day and just started putting it together and uh, getting things rolling. Great. And Maya? Uh, I wasn't lucky enough to be here at that time. That sounds like it would have been so fun. Um, I joined the college about a year ago, and I actually joined the college to help with the initiatives that we have in building a hydroponic farm at a larger scale on campus, as well as a food processing kitchen that farmers nearby can use to process more of their grown goods to value added goods. So with that background, we've been using the freight farm as a little bit of a um, lab for how we're going to scale up our mission. So when I started the college about a year ago, I started on a really small scale and have joined the team a little bit more intimately now. Perfect. And we'll hear a little bit more about that program in a bit. 
Um, so Hillary, you have been at it from the beginning. You were responsible for getting this up and running on campus and integrating it into the dining hall. So let's talk a little bit more about how you did that. Um, to start, can you give us just like a quick overview of who's involved in operating the farm? Uh, as of right now, um, yep. it's basically all students and myself and Maya, um, but mostly the students are running it now, which really was our goal in the beginning was to have it all student run. Um, I'm just kind of like a background person who, you know, checks it on my app every day and does the ordering and, um, you know, I do go in and, and check things as well, but really the students are running the farm now. They know pretty much how to do everything um, from calibrating to seeding to harvesting to transplanting, um, which is wonderful. So, uh, and that was our goal too, is to have them run the farm. Perfect. So tell us how you, um, tell us first, I guess, what, what exactly is growing in the farm? Uh, right now it's mostly um, green star rue, and then we have a, some arugula and uh, kale, and um, we always have edible flowers growing because they're so much fun to add to, to special dishes, and uh, they last forever, they grow forever, and uh, they're very plentiful. Um, so those are your violas, um, and I guess that's about it right now. We do still experiment here and there with the the little carrots and radishes and things like that as well. Great. Um, and where exactly, or how how is the produce being utilized? Um, I think you mentioned a little bit about how it's going into Pearson's Cafe. Is this for um, a salad bar or? Yes. Yeah, um, it goes directly from the farm to the salad bar often because we we use it as soon as it comes in. Um, we have a salad, full salad bar every lunch and every dinner period. We serve 19 meals a week out of Pearson's. So um, we use up all the, the freight farm produce within four to five days. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And can you tell us, you know, you said that you do the ordering. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you determine what to grow? Um, well, we've tested ever since day one, we've tested the different lettuces to see what grew the best. And, um, you know, with all the testing we did, we, we came up with Green Star and Rue being our two top uh, producers. Anything in particular about the characteristics of the produce that um, is appealing? Uh, well, the rue is beautiful, the rounded leaves, the red and green combination, um, and it, it grows very well. It's a little bit smaller than the green star. The green star, we just get more volume, um, mm -hmm. which is a great, um, great for the salad bar, you know, to chop it up a little bit and have it as a salad bar. But um, so we, we just get more volume with the green star and the rue is just more of a beautiful presentation. Great. And how do the chefs in the dining halls feel about the produce grown on campus? Oh, they love it. They absolutely love it. And they love seeing it come in the door. Because um, sometimes we do have to, to buy lettuce from outside and it's just never as good as what we have at the freight farm. Awesome. And do you coordinate with them to figure out what would be best to grow? Yes. Um, there's one particular chef that um, does the farm to table dinners and weddings. So um, we talk with her often to see you know, what's coming up in the future and what she'd like to see um, on those plates. Great, awesome. That's, I think that direct connection from the chef to the actual operations in the farm is so important and it gets key stakeholders involved early in the process and they can kind of have a little bit more ownership over the product that they're getting. Um, so tell us, you know, that you told us a little bit about the chef's pr perspective. What about um, other people's perspectives, whether that's students or um, other staff? Do they see a difference in the quality and, and how do they know there is a difference? Is there any marketing um, initiatives around the greens, specifically in the cafeteria? Yeah, we label um, Freight Farm Greens um, at the salad bar where we serve it, and we also sell it by the bag. Um, so we have quite a few people on campus who come and buy it uh, on a weekly basis because once they try it, they never go back. <laughs> they love it. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, great. And, you know, one thing that people often ask about is um, how do you handle operations when, or 
where do you put the produce when students aren't necessarily on campus, um, whether that's for summer vacation or holidays? Um, are there any other places uh, that you distribute the produce? Yes, if, if um, it's, say it's the summer break and we don't have a lot going on on campus, we do donate a lot of the uh, freight farm lettuce as well to um, Catherine's Cupboard, which is our local um, food pantry. Um, so that is one one source where we can we can That's donate great. our yeah. Awesome, and I love to hear that you're also hosting farm to table dinners um, and weddings as well, or, or integrating the the produce, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, to continue on. Hillary, your full-time position is the dining hall manager, so balancing that and overseeing the farm can be a lot. And like you mentioned, fortunately, you have an awesome group of students that are managing the operations. So now we're kind of going to shift gears and get a chance to speak with them. Um, before we do, I do want to plug that question and answer um, later in the presentation. So if any of our listeners have questions, definitely just put them into the panel. Uh, so Billy, Rebecca. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the student farmer program? Everything from how many students work in the farm? Is it considered a part-time job, course credit? Just give us the lowdown on it. Sure, yeah. So it's a part-time job. And as a student-led farm, we currently have two to um, three to four other students working consistently in the farm. And we schedule time in the farm based on everyone's class schedule and availability and use the an Excel sheet to organize it and communicate with people. That does get extended over the summer as well. Great. Um, so how did you both hear about the farm on campus? Um, just tell us a little bit about like how you came in contact with it. Sure, so I started working in Pearson's Cafe as soon as I started here at um, St. Joe's and then, um, when I heard about it the next semester in the fall of 2017, I um, asked to work there, and so I got hired there, and I took a class with one of our professors, Mark Green, and I fell even more in love with the farm. Awesome. I heard about it through the website, and I found it was very appealing to me since I was employed in the farm over the summer. Awesome. Um, Billy, I will ask you to potentially come closer to the microphone during this session, just so we can hear you. I think you're a little bit far away. Um, Sorry about that. That's okay. No worries. Just want to make sure you are heard. Um, so how do you guys raise awareness on campus for, for more students to join your team or, or tell us a little bit about um, that process? Yeah, so we drive awareness through campus tours. Um, we bring whenever we have someone to campus we offer to give them a camp or a freight farm tour um during a missions day we have our own booth i bring a entire tower out and be like this is what we have and we use lots of lots of signage and just talking about it with everyone we know there's a popular spot during our sustainability festival as well on campus that's great um so you know working in a farm is definitely um, not really something that you hear every single day. So what made you both interested in working in the farm? I have been studying hydroponics through my sustainability classes and um, how this new sustainable form of agriculture could change the food system of the future. And since getting the tour of the freight farm, um, it's changed my college experience completely the opportunities and experiences I have gained through my college experience um, has it shifted my focus my focus of study really. Do you want to um, elaborate a little bit on that Rebecca how it's shifted um, what you've studied? Sure so I came in for marine science and just working in the farm and learning more about hydroponics and aquaponics and all this different type of controlled agriculture made me um, pretty interested in it. And now I'm graduating in December, so I'm looking more towards it. Yes, and we will talk more about that once this webinar is done. Um, cool, Billy, what about you? I've always had interest in gardening and making terrariums and such. And 
when I saw the, that it was available as a summer job as well, I jumped at the opportunity. That's awesome. And so tell us a little bit about, you know, getting started. How did you learn how to operate it? So I was trained by working along the farm was up and running. I learned how to train other people. I think um, audio might be dropping out a little bit, but let's keep going and see if it persists. Billy, how about you? Um, I was trained mostly by Rebecca and Hillary. Great. Um, and tell us a little bit about what your typical work week looks like in the farm. So Currently, Mondays and Tuesdays are harvest days, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are transplant days, and Thursdays and Fridays are seed and maintenance days. Um, schedules definitely vary week to week based on um, student schedules, and I work 10 to 12 hours per week, and that includes communicating with other students to figure out who can work when. Cool. Um, what kind of tasks do you uh, each kind of focus on? Is there anything specific um, or tell us, you know, what your favorite part of working in the farm is? Um, so I work in the farm every week, overseeing the harvesting, transplanting, seeding. And my favorite part of working in the farm is the rewarding feeling of being responsible for the lettuce that we eat at the college and being so involved in something that's so sustainable. Awesome. Billy, how about you? Um, my favorite aspect was I got to, I had the opportunity to work with all the, the grow logs that we had. So I was able to see how little change affect how much I just produced each time. So seeing all the numbers is definitely my favorite aspect. Okay, great. So you, like, you definitely like the numbers <laughs> and more of the technology side of things. Um, yeah, definitely. Cool. So what is one surprising thing that you've worked uh, or that you've experienced or learned while working at the farm? So really it's how much lettuce that this farm can produce in such a short growth cycle. Like when I first started, I was amazed at how fast and continuously it was able to produce. Um, I was just, yeah, amazed by how much we can produce year round. Cool. Billy? Um, one surprising thing, I kind of mentioned it before, but some really small changes can affect like the yield of a crop or um, how much lettuce we can produce uh, a lot, a lot more than I expected. Cool. Um, can you, Billy, can you repeat that one more time? Just because I think audio is just going in a little, uh, in, and, in and out just a little bit. Yeah, no problem. Um, I see. Like small changes can greatly affect the crop size. Cool, awesome. So yeah, more on like the the environmental side of things, and um, maybe tweaking uh, some of the components inside. Um, so would you say that you've learned any skills or knowledge uh, that will help you in your courses or maybe your future careers? So then. I feel like working on the farm has changed my career focus. It really has changed the way that this experience has helped my career. Um, I Getting to work in the farm has helped me learn more about how the college's food system works and how things I learned in my courses can make a significant impact on the whole college's sustainability. Awesome. Billy, anything you wanna add? Um. I feel that I learned enough about hydroponics that I could apply it later on if I um, feel if it piques my fancy. Cool. Um, so, is there anything about working in the farm that's changed your outlook on agriculture or um, interest in an ag-related career? I, Rebecca, you kind of touched on this a little bit about how it's changed your major. Um, so, you think you want to stay in the ag space? Yeah, definitely. With everything that's going on right now and how uh, our food systems definitely need to change, I definitely see myself doing this in my future career. Great. Billy? Um, it was definitely a lot of fun working here, but being 
agriculture focus isn't necessarily what I want to do later on. Cool. That works too. Um, so thank you for giving our listeners insight into how you're running the farm and its impact on you both personally. Um, another amazing way that St. Joseph's utilizes the freight farm that I'd like to talk a little bit more about is how the farm integrates into the curriculum of the college. Now, Rebecca, you've experienced this firsthand in your classes. So before um, I let Maya talk a little bit more, I'd like to hear about your personal experience um, about how the farm integrates in, into your classes. Sure, so I actually had a class with Mark Green, who is in that picture on the presentation actually. And he, um, he had us built a small scale hydroponic system and we changed the nutrient concentrations within it and being able to test what works, what doesn't. And it really made what I've been working on in the farm come to life in my classes. And that's what um, keeps me coming back. Awesome. That's so great to hear. Uh, and something that I've heard come up over and over in our conversations leading up to this webinar is about the community-based learning approach that St. Joseph's College takes. So Maya, can you tell us a little bit um, about what exactly that is and maybe an example of how it's being implemented um, in partnership with the farm on campus? Yeah, definitely. So. Community-based learning is something that faculty members can choose to add to their curriculum. Um, it typically is uh, mission-driven and requires like 10 to 15 hours from the student throughout the course of the, the, the class. Um, depending on the subject matter, professors can choose contacts who are in the industry who are either off campus or on campus. Um, and since I mentioned before, a lot of our goal is to keep students able to be on campus. We do a lot of that with um, some of our food service locations, our CBL locations, and the freight farm is too. So one particularly cool project that um, the person who coordinates our, our community-based learning programs has spearheaded and we're, we're developing as we go is the idea of getting freight farms on um, native reservation land in Maine. And what I find really interesting about that is she's been able to facilitate students in our education majors who will develop the curriculum that teaches individuals how to use it. She's been able to work with our sciences to make sure that the, the kind of training manuals and the way they speak will communicate to the way that the freight farm operates. Um, and she's working with some of our kind of communications majors to make that curriculum electronic. And in doing so, she's been able to tap different majors, different interests, different focuses, and use one project as a central one that also impacts the community. So having one freight farm on campus has allowed us to bring different guests to the community, but also give our students kind of practical ways to apply their majors towards a project that they can see on campus. That's pretty amazing. I think it's so helpful um, in, in kind of taking the student outside of the classroom and getting them more hands-on experience or even just seeing how a, a certain tool can be applied to solve a problem outside um, in the community. So, it, you know, we've been hearing throughout this whole webinar a little bit about how the farm's impact can extend, you know, outside the campus. Um, but I think we need a little bit more information about that. So can you tell us about what the Institute for Local Food System Innovation is? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Institute for Local Food Systems Innovation is you know, a, a broader project that the college is implementing to kind of expand the reach of the type of student that we engage with. Um, and when I say student, I mean both uh, like credit acquiring tuition paying students, but also students who are just lifelong learners who might be pre-college or post-college and are looking to find ways to engage with our community. So um, the, the college has three institutes that are all a part of basically creating practical learning opportunities that tie in with our curriculum. So we have the Institute for Integrative Aging, the Institute for Local Food Systems Innovation, and the Institute for Sustainable Hospitality. Um, so that middle one is the one that the freight farm falls within and the one that most of my programming is. And the idea behind it is to use resources we have on campus. So the freight farm, um, eventually, hopefully our nursing students will be able to do more kind of dietitian based programming in conjunction with the food systems innovation. And the whole goal of that is to build 
enterprises on campus that bring more revenue to the college, so making us a little bit more resilient and sustainable, but also expand the opportunities that our students have to learn. So if they want to be a math major like Billy is, but they also want to have a certificate in hydroponic green, so they could apply it after they graduate. They can do those two things in conjunction because it's not necessarily a, a, a credit bearing program. So it allows us a little bit more flexibility. Um, the freight farm right now is kind of our, you, you mentioned this before that colleges do this, but for us, it's kind of our, our learning lab where we're testing out those systems and getting the practice of actually allowing our students to run enterprises. Because I think, you know, when we talk to our students about what works and doesn't work in their internships and college jobs is that they don't walk away with practical knowledge. So the Institute for Local Food Systems Innovation is all about providing that practical knowledge. And if we can start that with the freight farm and grow it into these other programs, that's really the, the, the main goal. That's pretty incredible. Um, and the fact that you are targeting students on campus, but then people outside, um, like you said, pre-college or people who are looking to do a career switch is pretty amazing. It just kind of shows the dedication that St. Joseph's has um, to the greater community in, in Maine. Um, so, you know, something that you've mentioned earlier in our conversations were about um, alternative food production within Maine. Do you see this as a growing industry and um, as, as a way to, another thing that you had mentioned is after these students graduate, you wanna keep them in the, in the Maine community so that they can um, kind of uh, spearhead initiatives um, that would be beneficial just for the, the economy. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. So the three major programs that we're developing within the Institute for Local Food Systems Innovation are a large hydroponic farm, a processing kitchen, and we have a, a stone barn on campus that we host a lot of the events Hillary mentioned, the weddings and the kind of ed agritourism edutainment events. Um, we chose those three industries because based off of a kind of intersection of studies, we found that those are the industries in Maine that are growing the fastest in the food industry. So for us to be able to keep people in Maine, you know, Maine is a wonderful state. Uh, it's a beautiful state that's requiring a lot of young people to enter the, the job force and uh, to be able to provide jobs that are living wages is a little bit difficult right now because we require a lot of kind of entry level work. So in establishing these three roles, we're looking to find ways to train students of all ages to be able to enter the workforce um, at a livable rage, wage. So by doing so, we're, we're developing levels of curriculum that are intended to speak directly to the jobs that would keep people here, keep people here in a way that allows them to enjoy their lifestyle and start families, start their own businesses, and just invest directly in Maine's community. Um, because we are a Maine-based college, our, our, our interest is in that, and we are a rural location. So we find that if we can directly impact our community with these programs, whether it's the farmers who need places to process food or folks who are going you know, from high school to college and are looking for ways to carry on their family business or start a new business. Um, those are the, the three areas we found to be most impactful that will kind of drive that, that market. That's awesome. Um, agriculture and food are such critical sectors for students to be exposed to uh, early in their education for, for the future. I think we see that um, play out you know, in, in the industry that we're in. We're trying to make as many farmers as possible, but to have younger people kind of joining the profession and seeing it as an economically viable profession is, is super critical. Um, so can you tell us, this is early in the process of, of these programs, um, what is it exactly that you need to get it all up and running? So that's a great question. <laughs> um, we need uh, time and resources. Um, I think right now what we're mostly looking for is support, whether it's from industries that are looking to buy products or work with us on our kind of workforce development chain. But we think it's really important to, to develop these businesses, not in a vacuum, but in a way that reflects directly what people are looking for. So um, from a kind of straight up perspective, of course, funding is really important because we're, we're looking to do all these projects at a scale that's actually impactful. Um, we don't want to just do a project that feeds our community. We want to do a project that feeds the bigger community and those kinds of projects require a lot of financing. Mm -hmm. So uh, practically financing is really important for us, but 
A big part of it too is just understanding what the market wants. So if we're growing greens for distribution, we wanna make sure we're growing the right greens. So we need partners for that. Mm -hmm. um, if we have more student learning opportunities, we wanna make sure that the, the companies that would wanna hire from our program are helping us inform the educational programming that we develop. So we really wanna make sure that we're doing this in a way that's um, thoughtful and helpful and impactful. And um, this is related, but a little bit of a, a tangent that I wanna make sure we hit on because I think what's really important about doing these things on a college campus is we have the opportunity to do interdisciplinary learning. And I think both of our students have talked about how, how that's impacted them. You know, Billy as a math major has been able to build out a beautiful spreadsheet for us that tracks our harvesting mm -hmm. and tracks our growth rates and helps us remember when plants need to be pulled from towers if they're ones that we trim versus harvest entirely. And that's an opportunity that he wouldn't have if we didn't have these kind of dynamic opportunities. So what's really important too is, is not just developing these things in a vacuum, but understanding how having a hydroponic farm on a campus can help all of our students, whether they're lifelong learners or undergraduate students. So I think also just, just um, having people help us think outside of disciplines is a really important role that our community can have in it. Mm -hmm, for sure. And you know, there, there, you have such big plans for the campus. Um, and, and you've spoken a little bit about the greenhouse, the hydroponic greenhouse that might be coming to campus. Can you tell us um, a little bit about what role the existing farm on campus will play in the creation of the certificate program that you've um, spoken to a little bit? And maybe just, you know, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit uh, just then and just figuring out like the kinks and um, in operation. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, having the freight farm on campus is basically allowing us to to figure out at a, at a manageable and kind of um, nimble scale how we need to operate. So if we can train five students to fully fully run this operation, we can figure out what they need, what kind of resources they need from us to help them be stronger and more independent employees um, and farmers. So I think uh, everything from reporting and communication has been really vital. I think uh, just having that direct connection, I mean, the freight farm is located directly behind Pearson's. You probably have to take what, like 50 steps, 100 steps at most to get to the cafeteria. So having that proximity also allows us to just figure out, okay, well, well, we can serve it really fresh, but what do our customers want? And if it can be this fresh, can we play around with different product lines? And I think just, just having the, the size scale and, and uh, flexibility of being small has been huge to that. I don't know, do you guys have any other thoughts on that maybe? I think that, 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 covers, that covers it for the most part, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's just important to be able to test things and understand that your market wants it. I think it's been really cool to see people, uh, particularly faculty and staff, but I think maybe some students will actually buy, we sell bags of greens. Um, and it, I mean, I know in my college, in my interview, before I even started working here, the, the person interviewing me mentioned that one of the perks of the job was that she can buy some of the best greens she's ever had that last the longest in her fridge. So that's, that's a good selling point apparently for the college. That's great. Um, so we're super excited to watch this whole program develop and hopefully, you know, we have some people listening that might be from Maine and, and know potential partners that can help get it um, up and running. And so if, if anyone listening has any resources or ideas, um, definitely reach out and hopefully we can uh, make some connections after the webinar. Um, so now let's talk about what you would do differently. Uh, this is um, such an important part of the whole webinar and we have a variety of different viewpoints here speaking. So this can range from everything like where you would put the farm on campus to maybe how you would recruit students. Um, so share with us any advice you may have uh, for other schools listening. So as a student, I would say um, just to start with total education as soon as it gets to the school because I feel like as a student I didn't really know about it until a couple months later. Um, it just needs to be talked about in every um, major, every place in the college and then here only about 25% of the students know about it so far so we are definitely continuing with getting it out there and stuff like that. I think that's a great piece of advice. 
Um, so make make a splash when it comes to campus and maybe even before some of our, our campuses choose to, you know, send out newsletters or try and get local press in. So I think that's a, a great piece of um, advice to spread the news, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah, I would um, I would second that and, and add to it as well. I think it's it's ironic that we're an educational establishment and institution, but um, education is our biggest barrier. <laughs> um, I think finding the right way to tell the right people about how amazing this is. Um, I think we have all experiences and probably a lot of our listeners have too that people don't really understand the impact of how awesome this is until they're in a farm. I personally did not live in Maine before I moved here and harvesting flowers in February in a t-shirt was a remarkable experience. Um, so I think if, if there's a food safe way to get more people into the farm and seeing how it works, I think that that would go a really long way. Um, I think you know this this is kind of changing people people are looking to go to colleges for different reasons and i think this would be one of those if i was to do it again and be a college student i would absolutely look for schools that have programs like this so i think from an admission standpoint um we should be shouting it from the rooftops great uh, adding it to our website is definitely something we need to be working on and um staying consistent with our signage and just uh, adding it to our new new student tour guides um, so that they are showing every new student that comes to campus you know what it's all about um, letting them in there to see what it's all about too is really going to i think grab their attention perfect thank you all so much um so we have made it to the question and answer component of the webinar um and I'm gonna just take it from here. I'm just gonna look at what we've gotten so far. Um, what has been the response by local traditional farmers to your campus hydroponic farm, if any? Um, that's a great question. Uh, education is really important, we've found. Um, I think if people think that we're just opening a hydroponic farm on campus, a little bit of a fear of what an, an institution coming into the marketplace will do to it. So I think that's part of why hydroponics are really important too, because we can change our offerings by the season. So we're not competing with our neighbors. Um, I think that's also why having the processing kitchen in conjunction with the hydroponic farm has been really valuable for us because we can, we can answer the question of, you know, how is this gonna compete with our sales by saying, We'll be thoughtful and make sure that we're, we're producing things that the market needs consistently and aren't competing with your marketplace but also that we're providing them a resource so that they can create value-added products with whatever they're not able to sell so on top of not competing with them we're hoping to actually extend their season as well great i think that's such a, a critical question that even we get a lot as um, equipment providers uh, people think that uh, hydroponics um, is going to kind of outplace them in the market, but we like to think of it as one piece of the, the farming puzzle. It's a great way to extend your season if you are a local farmer. Um, but yeah, exactly, adding, adding specialty crops that maybe aren't able to grow uh, traditionally in the soil, we like to think of it more as a relationship um, that we're all kind of going after the same, the same mission. So that's great. Um, Another one is a little bit more about the relationship with Hannaford. Um, they're curious about you know, how the relationship worked um, and maybe what worked and what didn't, if you can elaborate, if anyone here is uh, knowledgeable on the partnership. Yeah, so um, the answer to that is it's evolving. So right now, the relationship is actually very hands-off. Um, essentially, Hannaford had a resource that didn't work for the intended purpose, and they found us to be a suitable home for it. Um, that said, the relationship is still very much an open book, an open page, and as we reach the point, I mean, right now our biggest problem is that we can't grow enough greens to feed our whole campus. So as far as Hannaford's is concerned, um, they would love to talk to us once we're able to sell them back product, but our, our students are hungry enough that we we unfortunately and fortunately don't have product to sell. Um, so what we've found in an establishing LC, the Institute, is uh, conversation is the most important way for us to establish these partnerships because we don't wanna just arbitrarily decide that these four crops are the ones we're gonna grow and then have Hannaford or any other local partners say, nope, I'm sorry, we, we our market is saturated for basil or you know, leafy greens. 
so for us, the relationship with Hannaford is, is um, has been and will continue to be one where ideally we want them to tell us where their product category holes are. And we wanna be able to fill those in a, in a way that's, that's year round and consistent. So I think that's their main interest in us is being able to provide things that, that we, can, we can grow year round um, that will continually fill their product holes. Awesome. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's that's where we're at. <laughs> I think that's I think that's very um, very great way to answer it. It kind of answers the question that we also have about if you market any products off campus. Um, but it sounds like everything that's growing in the farm is currently going into dining halls. But um, do you expect that to change uh, in the near future, or um, Maybe you can even speak to the plans to market any produce that's grown in, in the future greenhouse or future great farms on campus. Um, so yes is the answer to both. Um, right now, the majority of the marketing we do is to our faculty and staff, our bag teams, but uh, we have uh, put a goal in front of ourselves to sell our edible flowers to at least two wholesale customers by mid next semester. And part of that is to, to the question you asked earlier, Caroline, is um, how is how is the freight farm acting as a kind of learning lab or stepping stool for us is uh, if we can figure out how to have a product guides, if we can figure out our pricing, if we can figure out making invoices and purchase orders and things like that, um, we can trust that we will be more ready to, to scale. So the goal that we have is to sell the flowers because we found that to be of what we grow um, the one that we have the, the most readily, readily available ability to part with. So, yeah, we found that those edible flowers are very popular to start growing in the farm. Every time um, we hear from a farmer that's in our network, I feel like they're experimenting with new flowers. So that's awesome to hear. Um, one question that we've seen come in uh, is how do you create a food safe environment in the farm? You know, I've seen pictures with you guys wearing lab coats. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on your process? Yeah, so everyone that comes into the farm has their own set of shoes that they wear in the farm. Everyone wears these lab coats and has their hair up. If they're a girl, we um, sanitize the floor every time we step in and out of the farm. Everything, or the counters as well, and the walls when we transplant and harvest, we try to do our best to maintain complete sanitation sanitation. Great. Yeah, that's such a critical part of um, running the farm that we get a lot. And we do cover food safety in our farm camp training um, for anyone that's listening that's curious on, on how to get um, all the knowledge on how to keep it food safe. Uh, so another really great question um, that you may be able to answer Rebecca or Hillary, uh, how do students hand off their farm responsibilities once they graduate? Um, well, we, we are on, we're always trying to bring in new farmers that are freshmen um, so that we have people ready to step right in when we when we have graduating seniors. Because um, we've lost a few farmers to either, they've either graduated or they've moved on to another school. Um, so yes, we're, we need to constantly be training for the next generation. Yeah, definitely within my college career, I try to recruit some people to start working in the farm and then train them to the best of my abilities so that when they're ready, they can continue working. So are you, throughout the year, would you say that you're actively recruiting for new farmers? Yes, yes. Yeah. How, how exactly are you doing that? Uh, the job is posted on our website as a student job. Okay. And within whenever we're doing tours, we definitely say the student job that you can apply for. <laughs> yeah, and Mark mentions it in his um, aquaculture class as well. Great. Um, another one is for Billy specifically. Uh, you mentioned how impactful small changes can be in the farm. Uh, what kind of data do you look at or what exactly are you um, tweaking to make the produce better? So it's not it's not necessarily me tweaking like nutrient levels or anything to um, increase our yield, but we like I've noticed sometimes we'll have a harvest that's lower than what we normally expect, and then we can go through the, our farm and see what changed. And for example, one time we noticed our yield was lower than normal, 
when he found a string of six lights that were out that affected how large or, or how little um, lettuce we got in that harvest. Great. I think a bunch of students led the charge on um, starting to weigh at four weeks and five weeks to determine which of our greens were at peak harvest at four weeks versus five weeks. So a lot of it has just been kind of isolating points like that and seeing how much how much manipulation we can do to figure out at what point peak harvest mm -hmm. is for each plant that we grow. Yeah, that's that's definitely smart um, just to maximize the amount of space inside the farm and how long certain crops are staying in the towers. Uh, we definitely set recommendations, but then when you're operating it yourself, you definitely see um, see things a little bit more firsthand and, and tweak the farm to uh, whatever works in your operation. So that's great. Um, let's see. So we we had a question um, for Hillary. What is the farm school that you mentioned earlier that you came to in, in Boston? Um, that is right at, well, it was originally at Freight Farms in Boston. Um, you have a new location now, but we go directly to Freight Farms and um, we spent two whole days there learning how to run the farm from, from seed to harvest and everything in between. Cool. Um, yes, we, we do have a new office technically still in Boston, um, and we just got our, our new farm on site that we'll be hosting tours and farm camp for in the future. Um, but then I, I believe, you know, sometimes for our, our larger institutional clients, uh, we do offer an on-site launch. Um, I believe one of our team members did come up to help launch the St. Joseph's Farm. Is that right, Hillary? Yes, yeah, Julia came up and um, she helped us program everything and get everything up and running. And um, she was absolutely fabulous. She knew that farm inside and out. And uh, we learned um, a tremendous amount of information from her. Great. Uh, we definitely yeah. have a variety of support services um, for our larger institutional clients. So if anyone listening is curious what those are, just definitely reach out and we'll, we'll get you more information. Um, We've got another one. Have you noticed any pushback from anyone on campus in regards to the produce being raised hydroponically rather than traditionally? This kind of goes hand in hand with the question earlier about local farmers. Yeah, a little bit from some of our local farmers who used to work here, only because we use, you know, um, a lot of energy to run the farm. Um, so that was probably the only, the only pushback I've, I've heard. Um, you know, just asking the question of how much energy the farm actually uses. Okay, that's that's definitely a good point. Um, and for those curious, uh, I believe the leafy green machine um, ran on about 125 kilowatt hours per day. Um, and then with our greenery farm, it's a little bit higher just because we have a little bit more um, power required for the new LED lights. So it's anywhere between about 150 kilowatt hours to 160. Um, but this, you know, another question that we get all the time is, can it be paired with solar uh, power? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we don't necessarily offer a solar integration at the moment. Hopefully, you know, in the future, uh, we will be able to do that. But there are definitely um, resources out there uh, or local grants we've had some farmers uh, utilize in order to get their farm completely solar operated. Uh, so that's definitely something that we consider in the R&D process and, and building new models is how to make the farm more efficient, both in from a, a labor perspective, but also from an energy efficiency perspective. So um, we can definitely understand any reservations people have on the electrical draw. Um, all right, let's see what's left. Uh, did you go through any approval processes to be able to bring the produce into the dining halls? Any what? Any approval processes? Approval. Um, no, we did not. Good. That's easy enough. Um, I think a lot of people are curious, you know, how is if there are any certifications or um, anything that they need to do. Sometimes the bureaucratic process can be uh, limiting uh, limiting our schools um, 
in how they can bring the produce efficiently into the dining hall. But you know, the, the farms can be GAP certified um, as well. So if people have more questions about certifications or that process, definitely reach out. And we are quickly approaching the end of our hour. Um, so I will just end on a quick thank you to all of you um, who've tuned in, but most importantly to our speakers for sharing their knowledge uh, and dedicating uh, more than an hour of your day to sharing it with everyone. So thank you all for, for telling us a little bit more about the farm at St. Joseph's.